Okay, looks like most of us are back. <clears throat> Get a nice lunch or dinner or um, if you're in Australia, I have no idea what time it is. But this is your last lecture. Uh, for uh, your cohort, is that right? Yep, good, okay. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Now maybe if we're lucky we can squeeze one in next weekend, right? <clears throat> You got to ask yourself, what would you be into in your three weekends if you weren't doing this, right? All right, so let's get started. We're, we're into the final stretch. What this afternoon is going to look like is um, we've got three more 50 minute segments. Speaking of which, I think I'll set my timer. Um, and <clears throat> um, let me get that timer on here. So we're going to do um, anticonvulsants and drugs for dementia. <clears throat> what I'm hoping to do is leave the last 50 minute section so that we can go over the uh, case presentation uh, assignment and uh, talk about what that's going to look like, answer any questions that you have about that, make sure that everybody has gotten onto the sign up. If you haven't signed up on Moodle yet for the presentation, get on there and sign up so you can get a time that works well for you. Um, and then we're also going to talk briefly about um, a relatively short assignment that you're going to have uh, between these two weekends uh, that will be due on uh, Thursday the 30th. All right. Oh, good. Well, thank you, Amber. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is fun stuff to talk about. I wish I could actually see all of you in person. <clears throat> but I think that would require a lot of travel, wouldn't it? Um, we're going to do anticonvulsants now. So let's talk about these medications. I have a vast uh, presentation on, on lithium uh, that we're probably not going to have time to pull in. I thought if we had more time, I might pull it in. Uh, so we're going to talk in, in kind of general terms about lithium. But let's remember lithium is the gold standard for bipolar disorder. Um, it is um, like uh, clozapine um, for psychosis, um, that lithium is for bipolar, the drug that can reduce suicide risk. And uh, suicide risk is a real and present danger for people with bipolar disorder. So lithium is a good, is a good choice frequently for patients. Um, loads of people, loads of prescribers avoid it because it requires more um, uh, tracking of labs, uh, perhaps, than some of the other medications do. Um, and so, uh, and it also is toxic in overdose. Um, uh, well, I shouldn't say overdose, it's toxic in um, if the, the blood levels get too high. So it is trickier to manage, but it has a long and really positive track record in treating uh, bipolar disorder. Some of the other medications that you can see here, um, you're looking at this list, the acute bipolar mania, lithium. Um, and, you know, people will tell you that lithium treats better from above than below. That mean, above means the mania, right? If you imagine pushing down mania or hypomania, that's from above. And if you imagine pushing up depression from the bottom, that's treating from the bottom. Um, another uh, medication for acute bipolar mania, uh, Depakote, uh, di Divalprox uh, sodium, uh, Depakine comes in an extended release, and Carbamazepine or Tegretol uh, is another option um, for bipolar maintenance, lithium as well, uh, Lamictal, 
I have often thought of Lamictal more as a medication of treating from the bottom up than uh, a medication for hypomania um, or mania, but it is um, indicated for that as well and for maintenance. Um, <clears throat> Um, I don't think there's much evidence for gabapentin um, or topiramate at all. I mean, they're just terrible mood stabilizers, really. Um, <clears throat> we use those for a lot of other things, but you're not going to be seeing those used. Um, not on here is trileptal oxycarbazepine, which um, my memory is, is that it is not FDA approved for bipolar, uh, but it is frequently used for bipolar disorder. Okay. Let's look at this. Age and ranges for anticonvulsive uh, medications. Um, these are for seizure medications. Most of the time, you know, I'm really not going to be talking about um, seizure met the seizures uh, and treating seizures. That's neurology's business. That's not what we're going to be doing. However, you're going to end up with patients who are taking these medications. Um, I have quite a few pa patients who like to uh, take uh, Keppra, uh, Levoturacetum, I don't really, honestly on that pronunciation, I am not sure, but um, I always refer to it as Keppra. Uh, we've got a, quite a few patients on that one. Um, and so these are things that you probably wanna be familiar with. You can get serum level on your anticonvulsants, which is really nice, right? Get a serum blood level and you can find out uh, if your patients are in the therapeutic level or not. Um, and take a look at anticonvulsants that are used in mania here. So just another way of looking at these. So the, um, I have used all of these. Um, I frequently use lamictal or lamotrigine. Um, I find that lamictal is really well tolerated. Um, if you look at the, um, if you look at the adverse effects, um, the list is pretty long and kind of scary, but in general, people don't gain weight or get particularly sedated or have problems on Lomicto for the most part. It's really, it's kind of just kind of a well-tolerated medication. The only thing that we typically worry about with Lomicto is, you can fill in the blank there, Stevens johnson syndrome. And if you remember what that is, that's that um, uh, rash that can occur that if it goes, if it continues um, and you continue to take the medication after you get the rash, the rash can essentially, you know, can turn into a, 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 something that is as bad as a third degree burn and actually needs to be treated in a burn unit and can be fatal, um, which is bad. So what you have to talk to people about who you're going to prescribe Lamictal to is you have to talk to them about this risk of getting a rash. Um, I do tell them that it can be that bad, but that if you get a rash, we just stop the medication and so it never gets bad. And that's the plan. And also if you dose it appropriately, um, according to the, the directions, it really reduces the risk of um, getting Stevens Johnson. One of the things you have to be careful about is that you're not giving it with another medication that has a drug interaction um, that, uh, uh, and uh, that is a uh, inhibitor of uh, the CYP450 system for the enzymes that break down lamotrigine, right? So you get way more lamotrigine than you're really expecting. So you got to watch out for drug interactions on that case. Um, <clears throat> however, if you dose the lamictal, you just start at 25 milligrams once a day. You do that for two weeks. After two weeks, you can double it. You, you get another two weeks, you can double it. Another two weeks, you can double it. Typically for bipolar disorder, um, and I see it's different here under the dosing, but typically for bi bipolar disorder, the max dose is 200. You can see it goes to 400. The dosing goes to 400, but typically for seizure disorders, that means it's safe to 400. So you literally, you can go above that, although the typical recommendation for bipolar disorder is going to be around 200 milligrams. Um, Lamicto comes in an XR, uh, extended release version, um, which is handy. 
um, and you can use that. I find that it, it, again, that it is particularly helpful for the depressive episodes of bipolar disorder. And I find this as an adjunct for treatment resistant depression. This is one of my favorite goes to's is I can add lamictal and there's those patients and somebody mentioned earlier sort of subclinical bipolar disorder. And you know, if we've, if you've been in this business long enough, you know that there's folks out there that don't meet the full criteria for bipolar disorder, but you know, they've got a family member or somebody that's had bipolar disorder, or there's some suspicion of that. And uh, they've got some sort of mood instability that you can't quite nail down, doesn't fit into the DSM-5 DSM beautifully, seems to be some cycling, but again, doesn't meet the <clears throat> full criteria, but it doesn't look like unipolar um, <clears throat> depression. Um, some of the, just as kind of a, an aside for bipolar disorder, some of the the symptoms that the people might have where you should presume bipolar disorder until uh, proven differently is if they're uh, they have an atypical depression uh, that is marked by hyperphagia weight gain and hypersomnia uh, and at, at this point call that clinical lore i actually did read that somewhere. I, mean, I, I don't know where that reference is anymore these days, but it is something that I've, I've sort of used on a regular basis, whereas if you see this sort of atypical, now that none of those by themselves would be something where I would be, um, that would be a standout to me. But if you see that hypersomnia, hyperbate eating a lot, right, and weight gain in unipolar depressions, you should really look hard at whether or not there's a bipolar component to this mood. Um, and so sometimes people have some of those um, uh, kind of odd symptoms that don't fit in the box and they seem uh, like they have. And, and, and that when I code this, sometimes I'll even code it as an episodic mood disorder rather than I don't put bipolar down um, and because uh, they don't quite meet the diagnosis, but I don't feel that unipolar is going gonna, is gonna to hit it either. And I'll add lamictal and I can really smooth out their moods with this. And again, as long as they tolerate it, which most people do, you're, you're fine. Um, so the, um, uh, one of the things you do need to know and you talk, have to talk to patients about when you're using lamictal is you need to let them know that 10% of people who take lamictal go to benign rash. So you can get a rash with this. Um, uh, and, but, you know, I don't know if it's benign or not. And uh, dermatology is a, is a tricky field. And uh, your friends in family medicine will tell you, you know, they can broadly tell you what, you know, a rash is, but they're probably not going to be able to tell you if we're looking at something that could become Stevens Johnson's or not um, at, you know, after two days. And probably dermatologists can't either. To be on the safe side, what I do is I, I say, look, if you get a rash, we're going to stop it. Um, I have rechallenged it in the future if we had good reason to. If the patient said, I, I tried a new soap, or you know, I found out that I, you know, I wore some new clothes without washing them, or I, you know, whatever it is, if there's a reason for that, um, or if it's a rash that looks similar to a rash they've had before, et cetera, I'm willing to consider rechallenging it, but that it we stop the medication and we have that conversation about that. And if it shows up again, then we just stop it and we don't start it again. Um, for most people, it's a, it, it, for most of my patients, it hasn't been a problem starting people on lamictal. Again, start 25 milligrams and double the dose every two weeks. And I've got had some people that do beautifully on an adjunctive dose of 100 milligrams, had some as low as 75. And I've, I've got one patient now who's on 200 uh, twice daily. So it really ranges in, in there, um, but it's one of those that you sort of have, want to have in your back pocket, particularly if you're thinking about those patients who seem to just not, for whatever reason, tolerate SSRIs. Well, SSRIs, SNRIs, uh, maybe they have a, um, you know, they get suicidal ideation every time you start something that's serotonergic. Um, they get uh, severe agitation or anxiety with the SSRIs of the patients like that, and you're trying to treat a depression uh, Lamictal may be one of your options, right? Another one would be, well, I'm hoping you're thinking bupropion or an NDRI, right? Because that's not serotonergic. But if, they, if they're not going to tolerate that, then Lamictal might also be an option for you um, off-label. <clears throat> uh, 
I will tell you that I had a patient who, if you note this um, on uh, lamictal uh, under cautions, concerns, and pearls, that oral contraceptives may need higher doses. Uh, I had a patient who was taking, um, but I started on lamictal for a kind of a mild bipolar disorder, sort of this episodic mood system that you know we were talking about syndrome, and. Um, she was also taking birth control. Now she was taking birth control to manage um, uh, problematic um, menses. And so she was having a lot of pain around her period. And so being back on oral contraceptives was really helping with that. But um, it was interesting that um, those that the combination of those two uh, on a CYP450 system, the drug interaction is such that it lowers the um, uh, efficacy of the oral contraceptive. contraceptive. So uh, if you're taking that oral contraceptive to avoid pregnancy and you're taking lamictal at the same time, you need to look for that drug interaction uh, and, uh, uh, if people would like to avoid getting pregnant. Um, so you want to take a look at that. It also lowers the, um, uh, the blood levels of the lamictal as well. Hence, if you suddenly stop taking that oral contraceptive, your levels of lamictal may shoot up rapidly, putting you at greater risk of having a, um, of a, of a rash. Um, uh, ED, does that increase the risk of PE, you mean pulmonary embolism? Um, does what increase that risk? Well, the oral contraceptives have a risk of uh, PE in the first place, and if this uh, if this changes it, and you have to take uh, higher oral contraceptives, that increase the risk. Oh, I see what you're saying. Thank you. Um, so, if it increases the ah, huh, that's a really good question. I don't know, but that's the kind of question that, that that we should be asking. I don't know the answer to that. My assumption would be that uh, that there is a dose response curve such that as you go up on the dose of the contraceptive, your risk of side effects such as PE might be higher. Um, so I don't know, and that's where I go lean on my um, uh, clinical pharmacists, um, in which we have a couple of them in our um, in our clinics, and I run this one past them. Um, Yep, thanks guys, I see the comments in there. Um, if you're high risk for those who typically switch to progesterone only, and Najib says, yes, that is true. So yeah, thanks for the feedback, guys. Great question, Eddie. I mean, that's, that's exactly the way we need to be thinking about these medications and when we're, we're working together on them. This is exactly the sort of way that we need to kind of create a safety net for our patients. We need to go way beyond sort of the real basic of, you know, this is going to improve your depression, you know, but what else are you taking and how is that, what kind of interaction are we going to see? What kind of effect are we going to have? Um, you know, in a 25 year old female, your concern for a PE may not, might not be that high, right? But in um, someone with a coagulation or a liver uh, function issue, or maybe who's older, uh, that might be something or who has some other predisposing risk that could be a contradiction for use, right? So it's one of those things you have to use. I'm gonna use this opportunity to um, uh, plug uh, pharmacist here for a second. So um, one of the things I have learned from, uh, from doing this is, uh, particularly from working in family medicine, is you know, I'm only, I only have to be a master of about 150 medications, really. Uh, that I'm going to use, and my my colleagues in family medicine, um, you know, it's in the, the tens of thousands probably. I have no idea. Pharmacists could probably tell us, but anyway, that they, they, they have to to know a lot of medications, and they've taught me that they don't have to know and memorize everything. They just have to know where to get the information and when to ask for the information. So I've really learned that lesson, and so. If you ever feel like you're swimming out of your depth, and there will be times that you feel like you do, and that's okay, you just have to know where to get the information. You have to know when to apply the brakes and go ask ask for a consult. And you want to ask for consults regularly. And I asked for more consults when I started doing this than I do now, but the consults I ask for now are probably more sophisticated. So, and every time you ask for a consult, you learn something. 
right? And so you kind of put that in your back pocket. You've got a new skill, a new, a new piece of information that you can use for the future. And that's how you kind of build yourself as a competent prescriber or prescriber over time. Um, having the right resources is incredibly important. Um, you need to be able to know where to go to get information. And, and you want to have some people available for consult when you can. Um, I'm particularly lucky because I can walk into the attending office at any time and uh, ask any medical questions of my uh, primary care uh, physician friends. And uh, because we have embedded um, clinical pharmacists, um, I will routinely send them, hey, here, here, here's the drug uh, combination. Of this. this is the regimen that this patient is on. And this patient is complex for X, Y, and Z, right? Maybe they've got um, uh, von Willebrand's disease, which is a, a blood disorder um, uh, that puts them at higher risk of a bleed. Um, you know, maybe they have um, another congenital issue or maybe their liver is challenged in some way. And so I can send these, that list of medications to that clinical pharmacist and uh, they'll run a drug interaction. And you now we can all run drug interactions and look at them, but the pharmacists are going to be able, they're much more knowledgeable. They're going to be able to really talk about not only what their recommendations and the level of recommendations uh, but, uh, of what you should be doing with that particular regimen, but they might be able also to make some suggestions about what some alternatives you could consider are. So lean on your lean on your colleagues, lean on, on, on the team uh, that you have available. And if you have clinical pharmacists, uh, definitely use them. Um, so we're just trying to keep you guys busy. Um, so let's, uh, let's move I'll, Let me talk about Depakote. Um, I don't use, I haven't used Depakote a lot, um, but I've used it effectively when I, when I have, it seems that, uh, the, um, you really need to be at about 1,000 to 12, between 1,000 and 1,500 milligrams, um, usually to make it be pretty effective for bipolar disorder. I have a bipolar one patient who is taking uh, uh, 1,250 milligrams a day in divided doses. Um, and uh, she is also taking, uh, she's taking an atypical, and I can't remember offhand what it is, and I don't want to guess what it is. But those are the two medications she's on, and she is rock solid on those medications and doing very well. Regularly get um, uh, labs on her, just to, um, um, probably surveillance of about every three months. I'll get a CBC and CMP, right, uh, complete blood count, and a uh, comprehensive metabolic profile just to get a snapshot of how she's doing. Um, is there an app for running drug interactions for multiple medications? Absolutely. Um, I use Hippocrates. You guys, are you guys all familiar with Hippocrates? It's spelled E-P-O-C-R-A-T-E-S, right? Um, it has a drug interaction um, program in it, and that's the one I use. And I think I mentioned earlier, I use the free version because I'm super cheap. And uh, the free version has always worked really well for me. You can also get onto drugs.com and run them, but I'm, I just kind of like running it from my phone. That works really well for me. Okay. Notice that the, um, in pregnancy, lithium and uh, Depakote are both contradicted. Uh, contradicted. They're um, category D for pregnancy. Mobile PDR is another good resource. I haven't used that joint, but I think I've, I've heard that that's good too. So Tegretol, it's carbamazepine. Um, I haven't used, I personally have not used Tegretol. Um, I find Tegretol uh, to be a little bit messier. Um, and so um, I have generally avoided it. Tegretol, after you've been taking it for a while, metabolizes itself. Um, so it's, it's a trickier to dose um, deal and it has more drug interactions with other medications that I might be using. And so I have tended personally to sort of avoid it. it has some other issues you can see over there and cautions and concerns. Um, got the uh, toxic epidermal necrosis uh, or necrolysis. Um, Dress syndrome and pregnancy, it's D, uh, agrinocytosis, uh, aplastic anemia. So 
and in, in my practice, Tegretol has been something I haven't used a lot, but I know that it is an effective drug and you can use it effectively for bipolar. Um, so it's just one of those things to consider and remember that prescribers are individuals and get comfortable with certain medications. It doesn't mean you should avoid Tegretol if I don't use it very often. Um, it's just something that you'll get comfortable with um, over time. So uh, anticonvulsants, um, some have significant toxicity, but overall profile superior to lithium. So when they say overall profile, they're really talking about risk versus benefit. Um, I, I don't want to make it sound like um, lithium is not still the, the bedrock, the bottom line, gold standard for uh, treating um, bipolar. The reason we don't is because it has some upsetting side effects that make it not very tolerable for some people and because um, uh, it requires what people perceive as more tracking uh, typically um, from the provider than maybe some of the other medications. So let's talk about, uh, so lithium, so what are some of the, I'm not sure if I have a slide deck on, on lithium in here. Boom, 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 I do. Yeah, we'll talk about lithium when we get there. Um, Topamax, let me talk about that for a second. So it's an anticonvulsant, right? But um, topiramate, you, you may see that used for a variety of things. One of the things that I see topiramate used for mostly is as an adjunct for either um, uh, SSRI induced weight loss and the evidence for using it in that way is meh, kind of mixed. Um, and the uh, Topamax is mostly used for, when I see it used, for things like migraine prophylaxis. Um, seems to be pretty, pretty helpful for that. Um, so that's one of the ways that you're going to see uh, the topiramate used. Right. The question, are there any medications that are helpful for hypomanic and or mixed episodes? Yes. And that's one of those I look it up when, uh, if I need something for a mixed episode, I'll pull, I'll pull up, I'll, I'll, I'll do a search for that um, because there are medications that are better. So for example, it, you know, it's the treat from above versus treat from below. If you know something's better at treating from above, that means it's going to be for better for hypomanic and mixed episodes. And I believe Depakote and lithium tend to treat from above pretty well. Um, Average use of convulsants for psych disorders increased. I don't think that meant 0.33%. I think that actually meant 33%. Uh, um, but uh, I can't be sure. It's not, it's not my slide. Um, let's see here. So prescribing during pregnancy for women with bipolar disorder. So let's see. So the date of this is 2012. So this is going to predate some of the Latuda stuff. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, so there are risks with, and you can see this in this for the mood stabilizers, and they list them down the left, Lamictal, um, antipsychotics, lithium, valproate, et cetera. Um, and you can see um, uh, the number in the, the N and the number with the, the negative outcome and what those negative outcomes were. Um, now, don't make the mistake of making the assumption that the medication caused those. It, it was just associated with it, right? We don't know that those would not have happened. There's a normal base rate of malformations um, and, and other problems. And I always like to compare that to whatever that we're, we're seeing here. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, what I will tell you is that this is, this is and has been a real significant issue is when you have a patient who's bipolar who gets pregnant, what are you going to do? Um, you know, obviously one option is not treat them. 
uh, with medication, um, but that can go very, very badly very quickly. Um, I have had some patients um, who have established clearly, clearly established bipolar disorder, I don't have a question about whether they really have it or not, um, who during pregnancy, for whatever reason, were able to go through pregnancy without medication and did not have a hypomanic, manic, or depressive episode. I don't know. Um, so, uh, but for the most part, you're probably going to have to medicate them. And there are risks associated with all the mood stabilizers. The, my go-to on this, and I mentioned this earlier, is lorazodone or Latuda. Remember, it's category B for pregnancy. Um, there's been some new data out on that that suggests it, it might not be quite a B. Maybe it's between B and C, um, but it is still um, probably our best bet at this point during pregnancy. I managed a patient recently um, with pregnancy who has a significant bipolar one disorder um, and uh, we worked really hard to stabilize her and then she got pregnant <laughs> and then we had to drop her off some of the medications that she was taking and we we in consultation with her OB what we did is we, we kept her on lorazodone at 80 milligrams lorazodone goes up to 180 and so we we're trying to keep the lowest possible therapeutic dose on board um, during the pregnancy, and she was maintained on 80 uh, lorazodone throughout the pregnancy. And I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was stable enough, and she did she did really well, and she had a um, a normal uh, a normal delivery, um, and the Apgar for the baby was good, and it was quite positive. So that's kind of a, an end of one example of using lorazodone. Although I should say that I've had other uh, pregnant patients who use lorazodone with good outcomes as well. So that tends to be my, my go-to um, for this issue. So let's look at lithium for a minute and talk about lithium. So um, lithium is uh, cleared through the kidneys. It doesn't, it's not um, metabolized by the liver. So remember we talked about um, finding something that's going to avoid uh, liver metabolism for some of your patients, well, lithium is gonna be a good choice for some of those patients, right? You think about your alcoholic bipolar disorder uh, patient uh, who has destroyed their, um, their liver, um, lithium is going to be a good option for them. You do have to look at thyroid and parathyroid uh, functioning for um, lithium. Uh, you, you can get abnormal values um, pretty easily uh, with that. And so that is a real, um, that is a real issue that you have to be tracking. So you're gonna you're gonna order in the labs. You're gonna be ordering a TSH and a T4. And remember, the TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. T4 is the the roxine. And so um, just looking to see that those are you're getting normal values on that. And I uh, with patients with thyroid, uh, excuse me, with, on on lithium, I'm gonna get that that thyroid check uh, once a month for three months, and then every three months for a year, and then probably every six months thereafter. Um, and then uh, things that bother people about uh, lithium are, it's going to be, there's certainly weight gain, but particularly the, the type of gain tends to be uh, edematous. So people get edema, you know, that's that puffiness retaining water. And so people get puffy and they don't like that. Tremor can be significant on lithium, you have a very significant tremor on that. Nausea as well. Um, and so that can be relatively unpleasant. So lithium can, can be, if you're really getting those side effects, it can be hard to tolerate. Um, you, you can heavy, your hands are shaking, um, and you don't feel very good. Um, the, um, you do have to worry about changes in levels of the, uh, your blood levels of lithium, depending on what the person does. If um, you can change your blood, remember lithium is a salt. So if you sweat profusely, you change the water to sodium balance in your body and end up having more uh, lithium on board in your blood system, right? Relative to the amount of uh, fluid in your body. And so then you can get lithium toxicity. So if you happen to be hovering about 1.1, 1.2 in your blood level, and you do, you know, you run a marathon and you just 
sweat like mad and you're not able to replace the water on that, you might get lithium toxicity because you're already close to that top end of that, that window. Generally for lithium, the, um, what we're looking for is a uh, therapeutic window is between 0.6 and 1.2, um, although it can go up to 1.5. Um, and you know, the thing about lithium is that it has what people call a narrow therapeutic window. So if it's too low, it doesn't do anything. And if it's too high, people, um, it, it's toxic and people get quite sick. All right. You see the notes here, I just have a couple notes, let's see. I had a patient who was on lithium and she worked for the park service outside all the time, became dehydrated and ended up in the hospital. Oh, there you go. Yep. There, there, right. Um, uh, are the cardiovascular risk factors not just not as common as the urinary kidney and thyroid risks? Because I noticed they didn't study the one big risk factor everyone talks about, which is the cardiac arrhythmias and the other uh, cardiovascular problems. Yeah. It, it just it doesn't have to be this one. In fact, actually, if you look at this one, uh, under conclusions, uh, note, however, that sudden death, cardiac arrhythmias, and suicide were not analyzed in the meta-analysis. Uh, suicide would have come out positively, <laughs> but uh, not, not possibly the cardiac arrhythmias, right? Um, so these are the things, this is, you know, this is a, this is a no joke uh, medication. You know, I, I often talk to patients about, you know, the big gun medications, and this is one of the big guns. And when I say that, what I'm talking about is, we have medications that are going to be uh, dirty or have, are going to have lots of side effects potentially with them, but they also may have uh, powerful therapeutic effects. And it really depends on the patient. And you, you, I'm sure you've probably experienced this, which is some patients on lithium are going to do fantastic and they just are going to do really well. And other patients are just not going to tolerate it. And, and that is the key to good prescribing, which is, when you're faced with this, um, you start somebody on the thing that's supposed to work the best and you start them on lithium and you find out they can't tolerate that. Um, what do you do next? And that's where um, all of this training you're getting is coming in, right? It's just like, so if this doesn't work or if they have intolerable side effects um, or they just will not tolerate it, what else are we going to do? Or, and people can also just say, I'm not going to take it. And, and then you have to decide what you're going to do instead. Um, uh, another one from Joy, but if people are dehydrating, they're going to mess with potassium and sodium, which can cause an arrhythmia. Yep. Uh, and from Jason, it's an interesting thing that so many people rave about how awesome lithium is at controlling their bipolar, but so many U.S. psychiatrists don't prescribe it because of the risks. Right, right. It is, it truly is a risk, risk benefit profile. I think one of the things this article was trying to say is like, hey, yeah, yeah, this is a this is a big deal, and we need to be concerned about it. But it may not it, it may not be um, as problematic as uh, it's been made out to be, and maybe we should be using it more often. And that's kind of the trend that I've been seeing regularly um, in some of the articles I've been reading, is sort of pushing people towards like, hey, we ought, we really ought to be using lithium more often. It really is a, it really is a good choice for some people. Um, I will mention another thing that, uh, so I had a patient who uh, was on lithium and um, she took a, um, a bath. Uh, she used, um, oh, it's escaping me right now. What are the bath salts? And I don't mean like bath salts, like the drug, uh, but the, the sits bath uh, salts. Epsom salt, thank you. So Epsom, she took an Epsom salt bath. What do you think happened? It's a long pause. Not to be confused with salts, right? Yeah. She got, yes, dehydrated toxicity. Yeah, right? Because that uh, waterfall of salt, right? So uh, it drew, um, drew water out of her system and um, changed her levels, and she got toxic and horribly sick, and that was the last Epsom salt uh, she took. She was, a, she was a, a, a great lady with a great sense of humor. Had, uh, despite the, how awful that was for her, she had a good sense of humor about um, how that happened. All right. Uh, combined treatments. Step BD um, is pretty much the same as the, you know, the Stardy um, 
study except for bipolar disorder. Um, what I will say about this, so, you know, look at the conclusion, combined treatments work, but must be applied in a long-term fashion. Um, many of you probably work with bipolar patients. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the, the starting place for bipolar patients with me uh, is always the, look, this is a disorder like anything else. This is like uh, 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 having any other medical disorder. This is like diabetes, multiple sclerosis. Uh, you have a disorder and the only treatment for, oh, TAU is treatment as usual, sorry. Um, the only treatment we have for bipolar disorder, the solid first line treatment is going to be medication, right? So there isn't like a non-medication option for bipolar disorder. And I, you really, in my experience, got to talk to patients through this because they, nobody likes to hear that. I wouldn't want to hear that. I tell them I know they don't want to hear that. And of course, I'm talking to the, about patients who are relatively naive to having bipolar disorder. But I have a 45-year-old patient who has been having bipolar swings and has had like 15 hospitalizations since she was 20. And I'm having the same conversation with her because she goes off her medication for a while until she has a break. She gets hypomanic, then she gets manic, then she gets paranoid, then she goes to um, the hospital, then she gets out, stays on the medication for a month and stops And She's been doing this for 25 years, right? So this is the, you know, um, the, the, the come to Jesus talk, right? This is the, look, bipolar disorder like schizophrenia requires medication. Therapy is going to help. Um, uh, and it can help a lot because all sorts of things can happen as a result of having bipolar and coping with bipolar disorder. Um, but you're going to have to stay on your medication. One of the big risks on bipolar uh, disorder is that people go off, off the medication because they don't like the side effects and they don't like missing out on the hypomanic episodes. And I get that. And I have that conversation with people about that all the time. I go, look, you're going to miss it. You're going to want to have it. But the problem is, is you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you get your hypomanics back, uh, episodes back, you're going to have your depressive episodes back. And that's when I remind them of how awful that is and that they almost killed themselves and that they have children, right? And so this is, this is the kind of conversation I have with people to really, really work with them on uh, adherence to the medication because that is the trick on bi with bipolar disorders, getting people to stay on it. And part of our job is not only sort of that education part that I'm talking about, but it's finding the right medication. Too often, I feel like uh, there's kind of a paternalistic um, approach to prescribing in which we go, well, lithium is the primary medication that we use for bipolar disorder. You have bipolar disorder. Get out there and take it and stop complaining and I'll take your labs. And as long as nothing goes wrong, I'm going to keep you on this medication. And what people do, of course, is what people do. They just stop taking it and they stop coming back to that person because they won't listen to them. But I think what we can what we can offer as psychologists to prescribe is we can do the listening part pretty well um, and we can work with them on finding a medication that has more acceptable side effects, if any, um, as well as therapeutic effects. And you might, and I, I warn people, look, hey, we may be spending the next year together working on this but it's worth it because you just spent 25 years of chaos. Uh, if it takes us one year to come up with a, a medication regimen that really works for you for the next 30 years, then it's worth our, our time. And uh, I, I find that people really feel comfortable with that and, and buy in on that pretty well. Um, okay. Let's look through these. Switching in bipolar mania. Okay. ADP stands for antidepressants. Um, so the addition of antidepressants and treatment of mania resulted in switching to hypomania or mania in 10 to 20% of patients based on this, um, this study here. Um, so switching is a real thing. I mentioned earlier and talked about a patient that I had who had we, it wasn't a switch really. What, what we had was that we just unmasked a uh, latent bipolar disorder by starting an antidepressant, right? Um, and that can happen. Um, uh, let me see, I wanna look at Kirsten's note here. I had a patient who was a frequent ER flyer, usually manic, bizarre, like dressing in a costume as a crime fighter and wanting to help the police. Ah, oh, come on, like which one of us hasn't done that? 
He was bipolar and admitted he stopped the meds because he was homeless and he didn't want to be sedated, especially at night for safety reasons. Yeah, that's interesting, right? I mean, that makes that makes some rational sense um, that that could be more dangerous to him to be medicated. Uh, and that is a tricky situation. Um, so back to, to switching. So switching is a thing. Now, with that said, I, I, I and others um, really often end up adding uh, an antidepressant to bipolar regimens. And I, I was doing it often enough that I looked at it, I was like, well, maybe, you know, is there any kind of real evidence for doing this? And it doesn't look like there's really any evidence for uh, necessarily doing that, but loads of us who prescribe for them do because we find that we can manage in, uh, uh, people's moods in terms of stabilization, but they've got this leftover anxiety um, or a leftover dysthymia that we can't quite hit. And often by adding, so, like perhaps uh, 50 to 100 milligrams of uh, Zoloft or 40 milligrams of Prozac, um, it seems like we hit some of those and we don't cause a push into hypomania or, or mania um, uh, because their mood is already stabilized. Um, but you have to be aware that if you do that, that that is a, that is a potential risk. Um, is there bipolar symptom burnout with time? I've heard that. I haven't really, I, I've heard that. Uh, I, I will just put it down that I've heard that. I haven't seen evidence of that, but I've heard people talk about bipolar burnout as people get older. I mean, it's maybe get tired, more tired. I, you know, I really don't know. Uh, some of you may have more experience with me um, than that. I can't say that I've ever met a older bipolar patient who wasn't still taking medication though. So, hmm, interesting question. Um, so uh, just something to kind of be aware of, the switching. Um, all right, let's see here where we are here. I wanna see kind of how close we are. We've got just a few slides left. Let's finish those up before we get to two o'clock. Um, okay, let's go to kindling and bipolar mania. Um, I, I presume that you've heard of the kindling hypothesis, the idea that the more uh, episodes that you have, um, the more episodes that you will have, right? It's like throwing uh, wood on a fire, kindling on a fire. Um, and, I, and this has been applied to depressive episodes, bipolar mania. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is an interesting concept. It's one that I think is, my, my sense is this seems like it's probably holds water. And it also really suggest that we should be very aggressive about treating bipolar episodes right off the bat. And, and also first episode psychosis, right? Um, this, this idea of kindling is that um, these disorders are gonna get worse if left un, untreated. Combining antidepressants. I'm, Curious about uh, your response to this. Here's the, the ham D scores. Um, and um, you can see where they're at. The only thing it doesn't tell me is the, is the ham D scores are higher, would be more depression, lower would be less depression. It's like uh, the combination um, separates from. Uh, Prozac by itself um, in all the combination used. So Prozac plus mirtazapine, Effexor plus mirtazapine, and Wilbutrin plus mirtazapine. Remembering that mirtazapine is Remeron. And that venlafaxine plus mirtazapine or Remeron um, has been pretty commonly used. I will say that I use uh, the combination of Effexor plus mirtazapine. Um, occasionally I use Wilbutrin plus any SSRI on a regular basis. Um, and um, remembering back to the STAR-D trial that adding an adjunct was slightly more powerful and that adding an adjunctive medication than switching. Um, so I think that's just kind of what this, is, what this is talking about. Would I use two SSRIs together? No, I'm not gonna go, I, I typically am not gonna be in the same class 
what I might consider two different classes, Effexor and Mirtazapine, right? You got a NASA and an SNRI. I would consider that. I would consider bupropion and NDRI and an SSRI. Um, so it's two different classes of antidepressants can be used um, regularly. Um, Let's see if there's anything I really want to hit here. Let's look at the bold. Avoid antidepressant monotherapy in patients with confirmed bite. No kidding, okay? Yeah, that should just, that should be a given. You're never gonna just start a person with bipolar disorder on antidepressant uh, monotherapy. Um, obviously, if you uh, get the patient in an acute episode, you're going to be targeting that episode. Um, notice the number of three point there, consider lithium therapy for all patients at risk of suicide or self-harm. Makes sense, right? Um, prescribe psychotherapy or psychoeducation, yes, of course, and indefinite treatment uh, is needed. Uh, so some of the basics there. Okay, Neurontin or gabapentin. Um, so uh, this is an interesting slide about uh, Pfizer having to pay out some money. Uh, they were promoting it for uh, migraines and bipolar disorder and approved only for epilepsy. Um, uh, I've never seen anything or heard anybody using gabapentin for bipolar disorder in any sort of effective way. Um, gabapentin has a lot of uses. We actually use it for um, migraine prophylaxis. Uh, gabapentin is what you're gonna use if you have um, Oh, uh, gosh, what's that headache syndrome that is so awful? Can anybody remember the name of that one? The, uh, oh, it'll, it'll come to me if it doesn't come to you. Um, so neurotinid, uh, neuropathic pain. Um, uh, actually, uh, yeah, cluster headaches. Thank you. Cluster headaches are awful. Um, gabapentin can work quite well for that. Um, the uh, neuropathic pain, Neurontin's pretty good at that. So there's a lot of uses, you know, off-label for Neurontin. I just don't think bipolar is necessarily it. And my guess is that it probably is effective for migraine. It just probably wasn't enough evidence out there for that. Symbiax, we talked about this before, Lanzapine, Fluoxetine. Um, I don't think I have a lot more to say about that. Um, you don't have to use Symbiax. Uh, you actually can prescribe Olanzapine and then prescribe Prozac and then ta-da, you've made your own Symbiax. It's all of the warnings that you would expect with Olanzapine, right? But can be a, a, an effective combination. Uh, Keppra uh, apparently is being misused these days. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a seizure medication, and you're not going to see it used for uh, bipolar disorder, but it's a very effective anti-seizure medication. All right, let's jump into our questions, and then we're going to jump into our break. All right, um, are, are we ready? Which of the following mood stabilizers has shown evidence that it reduces suicide risk? Sorry, Aiden, I probably jumped the gun on you there. Uh, I did that too fast. I'll give people more time to think about it. Let me pull that up. Which of the following mood stabilizer has shown evidence that it reduces suicide risk? I'm getting lots of Ds. Um, Aiden, do you have a poll that you're able to pull up? Okay, everybody's got pretty much doing D for me on that one, and that is correct, lithium, right? Good job. All right, let's go to our next one. Which antidepressant is most associated with switching in bipolar disorder due to hypomania and mania? I do not think I reviewed this with you. <laughs> I'm not sure you can know. Did we go, I can't, I don't know if we went over this, so. Uh, yeah, I know the answer, but <laughs> let's see if you do. No harm in guessing. If you get it wrong, though, you'll get an extra case presentation. No, no, no pressure. Okay, we got uh, anybody else want to vote? 
All right. So the, the answer is effects or most of you got that right. I don't, I don't know how you would have known that or if you didn't know that, but uh, good job. I'm not sure I, I covered that. Okay. And let's see, do we have yet one more question there? Let's see if we do. Nope, we're gonna get on to drugs of Alzheimer's. Let's take uh, a 10 minute break. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot them to me now um, on the chat. And then we're gonna come back and tackle Alzheimer's and solve that problem uh, and be hopefully done uh, by about two o'clock so we can move on to talk about our, our case presentations. All right, see you in 10 minutes. at night, um, or I would add uh, Zoloft, and I would start the Zoloft at 50, and I would start the Paxil at 20. So buspirone, somebody asks. Um, okay, and, and I'm not sure what you said for anxiety. Uh, Najib, I'm not sure what that, that question is for anxiety, what that means. The, add the SSRI for anxiety, I think that's what you meant. Yes, add the SSRI. Can you hear me? Sorry, doctor. I, yeah, uh, can you? yeah, so what I was just uh, saying is that he's having anxiety purely at nighttime, correct? It looks... No, all the time. Oh, it's especially all... At, especially at night. Oh, especially at night. Oh, okay. Yeah, but then... Um, I mean, Buspar or uh, Doxepen, wouldn't those be good additions as well? So, like, yeah, I like the way you're thinking. And by the way, guys, there's no, it's not like I'm trying to herd you to the correct answer. There are many correct answers here, right? There's a lot of ways to approach this uh, and deal with it. Um, I'm telling you how I would do, deal with it, but I like, I, I like the way that you're, you're thinking about this. I'm going to give you my personal view on, on Buspar. Um, my personal view on Buspar is that is the perfect drug uh, for anxiety because it's non-addictive, non-dependency forming, and has almost no side effects, uh, it, and it doesn't work. Uh, it's the it doesn't work very well part of it that makes me not use it very often. I don't know if other people have that experience with Buspar, but generally most people I talk to that's their experience. And primary care docs love Buspar because. It has no side has no side effects, right? And it's it's FDA approved for anxiety, and it's not a benzodiazepine. Here you go, you're gonna feel better. Get out of my office, and you know my my experience is they come back and they're like, I don't, I don't think I'm any better. Now, with that said, of course, I have a handful of patients who take Buspar and swear by it, but most of them don't. Um, I I generally like to um, uh, add Buspar because Buspar, it's a 5-HT1A partial agonist, it's gonna tune the serotonin, right? And uh, yeah, Buspar seems not to work for my patients, Mark said. Uh, uh, Eddie's all for a placebo. Um, uh, good. Burpees are a placebo, I think that's the way to go. So I, does that answer some questions about this, this case, guys? Let's go on to another one. Um, I think these are great, great thoughts. I can tell you guys have been educated on this and you're thinking about it. Um, let's say I'm gonna, I will branch off of this one a little bit. Um, that uh, let's say he has a primary insomnia. What would we do? Let's say we had Will Butrin on board and we tried the Paxil at night, right? 40 milligrams Paxil. Paxil tends to be sedating. And we're gonna go to the Bupropion XL200 in the morning and he's still not sleeping. Well, somebody mentioned sleep apnea, right? I mean, well, maybe we ought to look into that. He is 32, he's not that old. Is he overweight? What's his neck circumference? Does he snore? Um, do we have any reason to be concerned about that? Um, we should kind of work him up for sleep. Uh, is he taking naps during the day? What's going on with this guy's sleep, right? Um, we're behaviorists, so we should take a look at that. Um, Let's say we rule out sleep apnea, uh, we roll out medication causes, and it looks like this guy just has a long history of poor sleep, and it looks like a primary uh, sleep problem. Where, where can we go from there? 
So Najib writes, uh, what about doxepin? Doxepin is a tricyclic antidepressant that is, has been rebooted as a sleep medication. I've used it a few times. I think patients like it. It works pretty well. Um, the, uh, uh, you can use uh, clonidine. I don't generally use as a sleep medication because of its effect on blood pressure. I don't want to mess with blood pressure if I don't need to. Um, so if I was going to do something for sleep with this guy, I would probably, rather than adding an yet another antidepressant like trazodone, because uh, remember, I've got two on board now. I've got an SSRI and an NDRI on board. I'm probably going to do something that is not going to interact with anything else. Now, someone wrote Remeron. If I was going to do Remeron, I'd drop the Wellbutrin and the Paxil and switch to Remeron. That's going to hit his sleep, and that's going to probably improve his mood and um, his anxiety. However, if this guy's overweight or has a propensity to being overweight or is in the military and cannot gain weight, we could be in trouble, right? So I might do, uh, I, somebody's mentioned Vistaril, like a lot of people have mentioned Vistaril, not, Vistaril's hydroxyzine, right? Um, Atarax, Vistaril, hydroxyzine, those are all the same thing. You can add that at night, 100 milligrams, and that might do the trick for him. And we can even think more simply with this guy. What if we do something like just add 25 milligrams of Benadryl? I don't know about you guys. I take 25 milligrams of Benadryl. I'm a drooling mess in the morning. Uh, it really works well for me. So uh, there are a variety of things we can do. I'm really looking to not create interactions is where I'm at. So I might do something like a Z drug, like a Lunesta. Um, I might do hydroxyzine, um, but I am looking to not increase serotonin anymore because once you've added Wellbutrin and Paxil, there is a risk of serotonin syndrome with the, those two together. You're increasing serotonin a little bit and it's a very low risk, but it is going to come up in drug-drug interactions. And so I'm not looking to, to increase that nor the noradrenergic effect any more than I already have. Um, would I try CBTI? Yes, you should try CBTI way before all this other stuff. And I am jumping ahead on the medication piece only, making the assumption that he has a primary insomnia that has been intractable and does not respond to the things like CBTI and sleep hygiene. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm trying, you know, I'm, I really am focusing on medications here. And, uh, I, and, and I, I don't want you to think I forget that I'm a psychologist too. And I also do all that other stuff. Um, but I am trying to keep us targeted on medication. So, but you're right to be thinking about those other things as well. All right, a, uh, a female patient's uh, PCM has been increasing her Zoloft for the past month, and she is currently at 100 milligrams. Remember, it goes to 200. She came to you with a previous diagnosis of depression and ADHD. Now, we are assuming that those are correct diagnoses. At her next appointment, with you, she says she now has a terrific amount of energy, has been accomplishing a great deal of tasks, has quit her old job and started a new one, and has met the love of her life. She has only been requiring about three to four hours of sleep a night, and this is helping her get a lot more done around the house. Uh, your concerns? Lithium, switching, hypomanic, bipolar disorder. All right. What is she taking? Can I have some of it? Uh, <laughs> Right. So we've probably misdiagnosed her. Right. And, and she, this is, this is looking a whole lot like bipolar disorder, but okay. So, so we're smart. We went, Oh, this looks like bipolar disorder. Now, what do you do? This is where the job of psychopharmacology comes in. We can identify this stuff, but when you're sitting across the room from the patient, you're like, uh, all right, now what? Um, Right, and that somebody with ADHD and bipolar disorder are often mistaken for each other, and that's why I put it in there, right? Ah, she's just hypo. She's just hyperactive. Well, certainly stop the Zoloft. The first place to go is we're going to stop the Zoloft, and we need a we probably need a really good workup to find out if she's bipolar, right, guys? And let's I know you're all thinking that, so let's assume that we've done our workup, we've done a nice intake with her, uh, we've brought in her her husband. He's like, oh my god, uh, yeah, she's bipolar. Um, we're confident in her bipolar. Uh, doesn't look like a manic episode. It looks like a hypomanic episode. Just a correction on that one. So where do we go um, on that? Do you want to go with lithium with her, or do you want? Where would you go? Dress the sleep first. Any history of substance abuse? Great question. No history of substance. Right. Hey, maybe she's not bipolar, but of course we're, we're now we're assuming we did a good workup, right? And that we 
um, found out that she's not snorting cocaine all day long and that's why she's not sleeping. Um, let's assume that this is not a substance abuse. So let's assume that we've got the diagnosis correct. She's bipolar. Let's, let's, let's assume that. Maybe Lamictal, okay. Abilify or Lamictal, yeah. Uh, reasonable choices, right? Lithium is a reasonable choice. Uh, you just have to decide how you want to package this and how you weigh your risks and benefits. So I, I don't usually start with lithium, even though I'm here selling lithium to you guys, right? I'm like, lithium's okay. Um, the reason I don't is because I kind of save that for like, hey, when everything else has failed, we've got lithium. Um, and because it isn't as tolerated well as well as some of the other medications. So this patient might be somebody, uh, I didn't give an age in here, but let's assume that she's uh, of childbearing age. Um, so I might be looking at something along the lines of Lamictal, um, of uh, uh, an atypical antipsychotic like Latuda or Lorazidone, right? Um, that's probably where I would go. Let's assume no SI. Um, is she taking ADHD meds? No, she's not taking ADHD meds. Although, what a great question, right? Um, it, is she, you know, you can shove somebody into a hypomanic episode with a bunch of dopamine, right? Uh, we can do that. Um, if she's married, she met the love of her life. We want to calm this down soon. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Um, uh, did I say that, that she's married and she married? <laughs> met the love of her life. Um, so uh, yeah, back to 30 burpees, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I think what we do with this patient, now you've got the tools, where do you go? And I'll tell you what I do, and then you guys just, you have to decide what you do, um, is uh, I would probably go with an atypical or lamotrigine. Got a patient who is new to this whole bipolar thing. Um, I send people off and have them do a ton of research on bipolar disorder. I want them to know themselves and know this disorder as well as I do. I tell them that. I tell them to research it. I give them sites to go to. We talk about it. We talk about how they're similar to other people and how they're different. We talk about where their problems are. We talk about the medications. We talk about the need to be on in the long term and to be able to be on something that they're going to tolerate well. And I try to start with tolerate well first, right? And so that's going to lead me down the road of something like lorazidone or lamotrigine to start with. But remember, I told you, like, a, a polypharmacy with a very few bipolar patients, am I going to end up in a situation where um, they're only on one drug? Uh, Jason, I, I would start with anticonvulsant with the good side effect profile before an antipsychotic with a possibly worse side effect profile. Profile. Right. So you might go with like a lamictal. Yeah. And that's a good rationale, right? That's something that goes in your note right there. You document that. I considered uh, anticonvulsants uh, anticonvulsants and atypicals. We decided that we're going to start with an anticonvulsant first based on side effect profiles. But don't we want to treat the hypomania, right? So the lamictal, like I said, it treats from the bottom up a little bit better. Um, and what should we do with this patient? You know, I told you one of the things that I've done with patients like this that are looking like this is, and, and I, I was sort of talking long-term treatment. What do we do today? I guess I should be more specific. Probably give her five to 10 milligrams of olanzapine, right? I'm going to tamper down. Then I'm going to determine where we're going to go from there. Would we wean her off Zoloft? Nope. I just stop it today. Yeah, Lamictal is mostly bottom up. Although if you read about it, it's maintenance too. Great questions, guys. Yep, make her knock her out and sleep her through the mania. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that's kind of what happens with the uh, olanzapine, right? We're going to knock her out. Now, we're she met the love of her life. Hopefully, they're supportive. Okay. And they're not going to go skydiving. Case four. Uh, how long would you do the olanzapine for? Yeah, probably about a week. Uh, it, knock her out and her husband. Yes. Yeah, they should both sleep through this. Um, case four, 24-year-old female reporting full remission of depression symptoms after six months of treatment with Paxil 40 milligrams daily. The first thing you should be thinking about there, oh, she's 24 and she's taking Paxil. That's category D for pregnancy. Is she on, is she using birth control? Does she have a relationship? Is she sexually active? She has been experiencing depressive episodes about twice a year since she was 16. 
This is the first time she's experienced a treatment that has been this effective. However, she hates relying on medication and asks when she can stop taking the medication. She says she feels fine and would like to discontinue it as soon as possible. What are your thoughts? A year later, straight six months more, recommend CBT. Absolutely on the CBT. Good, sounds like you guys know. So generally speaking, people should be on one of these medications for about a year uh, once they start working um, because uh, risk of relapse is higher. It's really nine months to 12 months, but I just tell everybody a year, um, okay? It's too soon to stop is the answer. You can still start CBT and, and work on that. But we want to, yeah, stay on at least six months more in CBT. Yep, I think that's the answer right there. Um, she's having episodes for such a long time. What's the likelihood she will come off successfully? So, um, uh, Joy, thank you for your question. So, if she wants to come off, the bottom line is she's going to come off. And I tell them, I tell people, you shouldn't come off before a year. But what is the rule of thumb for more than uh, two episodes of uh, depression? How long should you stay on medication? The answer is the one everybody hates, which is indefinitely. Thank you, Janelle. Indefinitely. It's indefinitely. Um, yeah. Look, yeah. Yes, Joy. Forever. <laughs> Rebecca, forever. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Right. It just, uh, it, now nobody, nobody likes that one. Nobody, no patients like to hear that one. Um, so what I say is like, I, I tell people, this is what the data says, but I tell you what, like, right. I start making my deals. Uh, you're 24 years old. Let's say you stay on this until, uh, unless you're going to have kids, you're going to have kids. We're going to have to switch you to something else, but you probably should stay on this medication while you get your graduate work done or you get through your marriage, you get, you have your first child, you write because her risk for postpartum depression is super high. So I, I usually say, look, after five years, then let's do a trial off of it and see how you do. And if things tank, we can put you back on it, but let's do it in a planned way. Right. Um, now that's not to say that if she has a mild to moderate depression, that it cannot be managed with CBT alone. Right. And I'm not seeing any here that suggests severe. So we've got, we have options, but again, from a medication standpoint, where, where do we go? And I think that's, that's where we go. Okay, uh, case five, a 30 year old married male with no children, treated by his PCM in Florida. Um, I don't know why I put Florida in there, with fluoxetine 40 milligrams for mixed anxiety and depression. He recently moved here and you're his new provider. He says his depression and anxiety symptoms have all but disappeared and he has never felt better. However, he is having marital problems. I guess <laughs> depression is different in Florida. That's really funny. Um, it, it makes you older, what happens? It makes you retire. However, he is having marital problems because although he has interest in sex, he is unable to maintain an erection. His wife has accused him of cheating on her and they have started marital therapy. This has never been a problem before starting the fluoxetine, but he is afraid to stop because he doesn't want the mood and anxiety problems to return. What are your thoughts? Robutrin, Robutrin, Robutrin. Bupropion, Bupropion, Viagra, Switch or Augment. Yeah. So all, all reasonable. Um, psychoeducation for both of them, absolutely. Um, but you have to find out if he's actually not cheating. Oh, you, you are a suspicious guy, Jason. Definitely wouldn't stop the SSR right now unless he kept moving. There were giggles. Uh, um, so what we have here is uh, a, a very common problem that I see pretty often. One way that we can not have this problem is when we prescribe for someone, we tell them that this might happen, right? So that they are ready um, for this to happen. And we also tell them at the same time that we probably have a solution for this if it becomes a problem. So they don't end up in this position. So in my view, the person who started him on the fluoxetine did him a disservice by not doing a reasonable disclaimer on the types of side effects that he might be experiencing. Now, people are saying, hey, we can switch him, right? 
one of the things we can do is switch them from fluoxetine to somebody just mentioned Lexapro. Maybe it'll have the same effect on the Lexapro um, and have an improvement in his interest in sex. Um, let's say we do that. We, uh, we do a successful switch over to Lexapro. Uh, how would I do a switch, you ask? So I would drop him to, remember, fluoxetine has a really super long half-life. I would drop him to 20 milligrams of fluoxetine um, for probably, if there was no hurry, I would probably do it for uh, a week or two. And then I would start um, 10 milligrams of Lexapro. Um, and then in another week, I would drop the Prozac, the 20 Prozac, and I would increase to 20 of the Lexapro and see how it's going. So, um, now, uh, what sometimes happens, and I've done this before, what happens is, yeah, so you're t uh, Abdullah's talking about it has to be tapered, a uh, washout period, 14 days minimum, and you're talking about for the fluoxetine, and I know what you're talking about. So what he's saying is like, hey, this is really, one week is not a washout on, on fluoxetine because the half-life of the uh, metabolite of fluoxetine is about two weeks. So a wash, like one life washout is about 10 days, right? So you probably are at 10 weeks to get even a half-life, uh, one half-life out. But I don't worry about that. And the reason I'm not worried about that is because I'm replacing it with another serotonergic agent. I'm dropping him to 20. Yes, in a week he's still at 40 of fluoxetine, but I also know that we can take fluoxetine all the way up to 80, so he's on half that dose. So my rationale for adding 10 milligrams of Lexapro while he's still on the 40 and it's tapering um, is that um, hopefully these two are going to cross each other in some way and I'm going to keep them stabilized at about the same uh, exposure of serotonin. Um, and that, if, if that makes any sense. So what you're saying is true about the half-life, but this is the reason that I do it that way that I was just talking about. And it's trickier with Prozac. It's easier with some of the other drugs. Um, and I find that people tend to tolerate this pretty well. Um, remember I said one to two weeks uh, or two weeks if we're not in a hurry. Um, this guy might be in a hurry to make something change. Um, okay. And the switching of, of uh, antidepressants is, is a thing. You kind of got to learn how to do it. And I generally bring people down to at least half of whatever the, the normal dose or the maximum dose is before I switch them to something something else to introduce it. Um, and um, it's something you kind of have to learn how to, how to do. We don't want to give somebody serotonin syndrome, so we're not trying to overload them on serotonin, but we also don't want to create a situation in which we give them a big fat dip uh, in serotonin, which is less likely on the Prozac, right? Um, where he has a crash uh, of anxiety and depression, and then we bring him back up with the next drug. We want to sort of try to, um, help him get through that in a, in a, um, in a balanced way. So with him, we switch him to Lexapro, still, uh, still having ED. But the Lexapro is, is, is just as helpful as the uh, Prozac was. So um, yeah, we could try Viagra. Um, Say Alice, we could do that. I would probably. Um, so we are making. Thank you. Who put wrote that? Uh, Rebecca. So Rebecca writes, see a urologist. So a pro, not a urologist, but probably PCM. I mean, one of the questions that we should be asking here is, it, we are assuming that the ED is a problem that's related to the SSRI because of the timing, the proximity of when he started taking it, when he got the ED, and we are probably right. But it would not hurt to have him have a medical workup to make sure that there was not another problem uh, in place, right? So, yeah, for sure. Cardiovascular health. He's 30. Um, let's assume that he's pretty helpful. But, yes, we should ask that question. Um, certainly, if you were going to consider Viagra or Cialis, you would want to know uh, if he's hypertensive. Could be a drop in testosterone, although be careful about looking for zebras when the horses are right there. So it's pro, and it could be a really, yes, could be, could be a lot of things, right? Could be a lot of stuff. Um, you, guys, you guys are really good, you're good thinkers. You're thinking about all these possible, all these possibilities. But I'm trying, I was trying to make this one relatively simple, which is 
this is really a situation in which we're having an SSRI um, uh, uh, related sexual dysfunction. And if that is the case with this patient, the next step after switching him to Lexapro, which still worked but had the ED, I would I would add a um, I would probably personally add Wellbutrin um, or Buspar at that point, and then reassess. No, good questions, good comments. Um, okay, we have one more case. Um, Rebecca, I recommended this to a PCP about my patient and she refused saying that Lexapro would be worse. Yeah, they don't know. There's a lot of things that people don't know. Um, okay, so um, case six, 28 year old female, eight months pregnant, three children previously, uh, each time has developed severe postpartum depression. With homicidal ideation towards her infant, has never tried to harm her children, but is worried she will have these thoughts again. She asked her PCM to prophylactically start her on an SSRI. She's heard good things about Paxil. What are your thoughts? No Paxil from Heather. D from Maribel. No, no Paxil. Why? You hate Paxil? You hate the manufacturer? Birth defects. Right. Paxil is... Uh, um, is contraindicated in pregnancy because it's category D and there are known birth defects. Oddly, um, Paxil actually is considered okay for uh, breastfeeding, believe it or not, um, which is weird. Uh, so generally, we just, that's almost not helpful because, uh, you know, why would you ever start anybody or uh, you probably wouldn't start somebody on Paxil when they're breastfeeding. Uh, you're probably going to have them on an SSRI prior to that, and they may have another baby, and so you probably wouldn't start Paxil. So I generally just avoid Paxil. Sertraline is actually uh, probably the primary recommended SSRI during breastfeeding. So I start her on Zoloft, um, and in conjunction with Roe-V, right? Yeah. Um, Sertraline is the safest. Sertraline has a lot of data for it, Prozac isn't a bad idea, but the problem with Prozac is has a real long half-life, right? And so uh, it, the baby is going to have to clear that uh, fluoxetine as well uh, that has that really long half-life. So if the baby's having any um, agitation or is colicky or something as a result of the Prozac, um, then that's going to take a while to clear. And um, of course, um, all all these medications are going to come through the breast milk and trace amounts um, as well. All right. Um, uh, what about Celexa? Uh, isn't that considered lower risk? Um, I think Celexa and, and uh, Paxil, uh, excuse me, Celexa and Lexapro have lower side effects. Um, uh, but I haven't seen in what I, what I've read, they're not contraindicated. They're all category C, except for Paxil, that is category D. Um, and it kind of depends, honestly, on what the uh, provider really likes to use. Um, and, but if you read the, uh, the literature on it, the latest literature I read about it, it seemed to be that they were leaning more towards sertraline. I say more about anti AD use in colicky babies. So one of the things that we worry about is, you know, one of the reasons that we, we say, well, we should consider whether or not babies with the parents should, mother should breastfeed uh, while they're on uh, antidepressants. And it, it generally it's fine. And right, if they have postpartum depression, it's much riskier to not have them on a medication uh, than it is to um, uh, just let them, let them be. So, um, Oh, certainly has a lawsuit for congenital defects. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I, we'll, we'll see where that goes because, yeah, we'll see where that goes. Um, yeah, I, I don't know where we're going to go with that one. Um, and and it is, it's a very difficult situation because these patients, a lot of them require an antidepressant. Most of the data on antidepressant use during, and I 
can't get into this too far, but I've got a bunch of slides on it. Most of the data on antidepressant use during pregnancy, um, it, the, the, the risks sort of wash each other out of not being on something and being a, de a very depressed mother um, has risks and, uh, and negative outcomes on uh, birth rates, birth weight, and prematureness as, as, and APGARs, as does uh, using uh, an antidepressant. And so it, there really is a, a risk benefit that needs to be, that needs to be determined. Um, if there's currently a lawsuit on Zoloft, then I would shift away from Zoloft and I would go to something else um, until that lawsuit is resolved. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, as a psychologist, I would not go for medications. Um, so I will tell you this. Um, I, you have to weigh the risks and benefits. A lot of people can tolerate um, uh, depressive symptoms throughout a pregnancy, but it puts them at risk for postpartum depression. Postpartum depression, as you know, is no joke, um, and you, you've got to treat it. And postpartum depression does not um, respond to uh, CBT. Um, I don't care how good you are. And, you know, after the first three weeks after, after delivery, uh, uh, everything's, everything's a go. Cause those are, that's all hormones. You're not going to diagnose a postpartum depression, but after three weeks, um, that's when we're starting to look for symptoms of postpartum depression. And if postpartum depression really kicks in and gets bad, it's going to get severe, which means it's going to get severe typically with psychotic symptoms. Um, and once I get a patient who's psychotic with, uh, depressed with psychotic symptoms, who's postpartum, now we're using atypicals, right? Um, I'm going to use an antipsychotic with them. Um, and I find that it's much better to um, uh, start with an antidepressant. And you know, even if they don't use it during the pregnancy, that's fine. Uh, but during the postpartum uh, period, using a medication, if they're high risk for developing postpartum or they're starting to show symptoms, you really have to start a medication. I've seen lots of problems with people ignoring the postpartum depression, um, kind of wanting it to go away or wanting to therapize it away, and it just getting a lot worse and, and, and pretty dangerous. So um, I... I uh, I take postpartum depression uh, very seriously after having seen a few cases uh, of that. Um, so, all right, uh, you guys are awesome. You guys have just great ideas. Uh, you're thinking about this in the way that I wanna see you thinking about this stuff. You're asking good questions. You're bringing in good information. So I like it. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, send me questions or comments if you have any. Uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to finish up with uh, talking about our case presentation. All right, I'll see you in 10 minutes. The final dash here. Okay. So let's go. We're going to do this relatively rapidly. I've sent this to Aiden via uh, email and he can post it on Moodle. Um, Aiden, I just, uh, you'll, you'll see that in your uh, inbox. If you have any questions, let me know. This is your, uh, this is the assignment guys, and it, it's meant to be relatively brief. I'm just gonna, let's read it together and then uh, talk about what it means and then move on to the case presentations. So the, the case is a patient is a 32 year old female with bipolar two disorder. She has chronic recurring remitting multiple sclerosis and gets a crevus infusions every six months to treat that. She's followed by neurology. She is in remission for over three years for an alcohol use disorder. During bipolar episodes, she has a history of auditory hallucinations, severely reduced need for sleep, obsessive compulsive behaviors, and paranoia. She has been aggressive and violent during hypomanic episodes in the past, especially when using alcohol. She occasionally uses marijuana. She, uh, by the way, legal here in uh, Washington. She is functioning very well since being on the current medication regimen for over two years. It should be regimen, not regimen A. She is... Uh, working full-time, uh, managing two businesses, and is actively involved in her son's school. She has no obvious visual symptoms. I, uh, that's probably not a great way to write that. I didn't mean that visually that you can see uh, that she has visual symptoms. Uh, she doesn't have any obvious symptoms that you can observe of MS, but reports ocular changes, right-sided weakness, and fatigue with flare-ups. So things we're not seeing, but that she can experience. She has no other medical problems of note. 
our current medications are um, trying to make this not complicated. So no other medical problems you need to check into. She's on Adderall XR 30 milligrams in the morning. She takes a Bilify 15 milligrams at night and she's taking 100 milligrams of Zoloft uh, um, in the morning. And she gets those Acrevis infusions every six months. You have access to her notes from a previous psychopharmacologist who reports that this medication regimen has been very effective. She'd like to continue. Uh, and it's, only been, it's been the only effective treatment that she's been on. So this is the sort of thing I was talking about earlier. This is sort of you inherit things. And this is by far not the most complex uh, patient that you can inherit. Um, but you inherit these patients, and there are some inherent issues in the medications that they're taking and their disorders, and you, you have to make a decision about how you're going to proceed. So I, I just want you to think this through. I want a brief, I really mean brief paragraph, and I don't want a long one. This is something that would go in a chart that would support why you would continue the regimen, and it can't just be, um, she, is this what we're doing for your 15 to 20 minute presentation? No, this is, I'm sorry, I should clarify. This, uh, Dr. Steinman asked me to give you a between weeks, between this week and the 7930 um, case presentation. She asked me to give you an assignment um, and I, uh, we wanted it to not be very long. Um, and so this is two short paragraphs that could be in a chart. So one paragraph supporting why you're gonna continue that um, and you're not, and not just because she says it's good and because the previous prescriber said it's good. It's like, what is your reason? What is your rationale for continuing this from a psychopharmacological perspective? And then the same thing for uh, changing it. So if you look at this and you're like, well, I don't wanna do that. I wanna do something different. I think something different ought to happen. Uh, explain to me why, uh, explain in the chart, like to other providers, why you're gonna change this, um, what your concerns are and what your rationale for changing it and why you think it's gonna work. Does anyone have any questions about that? That's gonna be due at, um, uh, on the 30th. So uh, the uh, Thursday, April 30th. Um, I think you turn, you turn those into Moodle, I think. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, so pretty, it seems pretty straightforward. If you end up having questions about this as you go, just let me know. But I, I think it, it, it really is meant to be straightforward. Really imagine that you are going to do this and you have to write in the chart um, and that other providers are going to see this um, and are going to want to know why you've done what you did. Okay, so I'm all right, I'm going to get out of this now. Um, And then, let's see here. Just give me a minute, guys, while I look at the laptop here. All right. To screen. Okay, let's look at the uh, case presentations. We only have about 11 slides here. And um, I, I think you've already seen the grading rubric for this, but let's go through the case presentations. I believe this is essentially your 
um, um, kind of your capstone experience here. Keep in mind, well, we'll go, we'll go over and go over this in detail. So um, <clears throat> you were doing, uh, you know, we talked about the difference between psychology and medicine. This is a medical case presentation. Um, uh, for a psychological case presentation, I could see us uh, spending about an hour on this, but that is not what we are doing here. We're gonna do a medical case presentation. It's shorter and sweeter. And more to the point, we're going to be doing about a aim for about 10 minutes uh, so that we have a little time to run over if we need to. Um, so medical case presentations uh, kind of talk about how it omits a lot of the psychological detail. Um, we're not trying to disclose a lot of information. We're just getting to the point. Um, and part of what you're doing with this and what you're practicing is really talking to other medical providers. Um, and uh, be concise. Three to five minutes is what you get in rounds. That is true. This is not rounds. We're going to go for 10 minutes. Um, and uh, uh, kind of advice here, not speculating. And uh, you can use the patient's own words to describe what they're experiencing, um, if that's helpful. So um, you're going to present a case that you know well, one of your cases. Um, and you can provide as much of the clinical information as you know. Um, you want to be able to discuss uh, the differential diagnosis. Um, I honestly don't care so much about the ICD-10 as much as that I want you to be able to talk about why, why this diagnosis and why not, what are your rollouts and how did you get here? And you're going to be talking about the pharmacological management, of course, of this patient. Um, I know that you are all accomplished psychologists and I am not worried about the psychological component of this. I know you know what to do. Um, so I don't need you to present to me on what you would do for, for CBT or uh, interventional therapy or anything else. Um, we're, we're just gonna be focusing on medication. Um, really gonna want you to give me the detail on the medications and uh, be clear about what your treatment strategy is. Um, I would say, um, as we've talked over things, one of the things you want to be cognizant of is uh, sometimes there is a short-term treatment, a mid-term treatment, and a long-term treatment. And with other patients, it's sort of just, we start today and we're just going to continue this for the rest of your life. So understand what your strategy is with this particular patient and their issues and how you're going to address that. Um, if this is a patient who has lots of fluctuations and changes, then um, I want you to mention that, you know, if this is like, are you going to modify the medication regimen in response to changes in clinical presentation? So well, let's look over this. This is going to be pretty much how you're going to outline it. And here's some examples, right? Um, and I probably don't need to read this to you. You have access to this medical case presentation uh, summary. This is going to be, this is on Moodle now. And so you can look at this and, and use this uh, for your format. Uh, so we're going to do ID, chief complaint, history of present uh, illness, uh, history of past illness, right? How did we get here? pertinent medical history. Um, I recognize that in some of these cases, you may not have access to your patient's medical record, so you just have to put together what you have based on the information that you have from your patient. So just do your best with this. Uh, if you can get a chart, great. Um, if you can get some additional information, great. Uh, just do your best. I realize that for those of you not working in a, a medical um, in a medical office, you, you may not have direct access to those things. You probably have a decent medical history from your intake with them, and a family history, and a substance use history as well. So you're gonna talk about what the current psychotropic medications are. Um, your um, uh, 
I don't think there's really anything much to say about that other that's a fun way to write it. Um, I do want all medications on there. I don't see it included in, oh, I do see it, they're OTC. So I want uh, over-the-counter medications, any herbal supplements, anything else that the patient's taking, we want the full record of it. And then, you know, what labs um, um, do we have, if any? Now, you may not have labs. And what labs do you want? Um, what labs are you gonna order? So you may or may not have labs available um, to report on. If you do, report on them. If you do not, then uh, either way, I want to know what labs you're going to be ordering. Um, so, so we can talk about uh, uh, physical assessment. Um, have you guys done review of systems? Okay. So you can use whatever style of review of systems that you've used in the past is fine with me. Um, you're gonna wanna look at um, the, uh, if there's any testing that you're gonna do with this particular patient. So for example, um, if this is a patient uh, who's on an atypical antipsychotic, you're gonna wanna talk about AIMS testing. Uh, there's AIMS, there's there, there was one. Um, so the mental status exam. So your differential. How did you, your diagnostic formulation is, how did you get there? Um, then of course you, you need to have a plan. Um, I suspect you're gonna be using patients that are not like, you know, in a, in a currently in a crisis um, that you're gonna to have to hospitalize now, but you could, and if so, you'd wanna talk about that. Uh, you wanna talk about, um, again, with the psychotherapy um, recommendations can, and behavioral interventions, you can be brief on that. I really want you to focus on the pharmacotherapy. Um, and then of course, there's always a statement of, uh, informed consent. Now it looks like people have been sending, uh, chats and I want to go, I want to take a look at that and see if there's anything that I need to respond to. Um, so pick a patient who's on meds currently, I would. Can you make up the case? Uh, I would prefer that you not make up the case and that you can use a, a, a case that exists. Um, yeah, you can also go to the literature and find some case presentations there and you can, uh, if you need that. So if you absolutely have no access uh, to patients or a case, you can do that. Um, are the slides posted? Yep, they're on Moodle. Uh, if you don't have lab findings, that's fine. And you know, speaking of making up things, if you would like to make up lab findings, I'm fine with that. I, I just want you to have practice doing this. So if like labs are normal, you can say they're normal. Or if you'd like to have their, you know, if you don't have labs um, uh, and you want to indicate that there's um, uh, this patient, you know, they have a history of anemia or something, you can reflect that in the labs if you want. But at the very least, I'd want you to have what labs do you want for this particular patient, if any. Would we have to make some of that up if we don't have access to a physical assessment in labs? I guess, you know, I think the, I think the answer is yes on that if you have to. Really what I'm looking here, if you can use your own patient data, whatever you can use, try to use that. Um, but what we're really after here is just sort of the practice of presenting this information. So I want the information to be there. And so if you have to uh, kind of guess to what the, some of the physical assessment or labs are, go ahead and just put it in there. Uh, yes, you pick a, a real life case if you can. Um, when do you have to submit the slides? Hmm. Um, why don't we assume that you should have the slides in? Um, um, <sighs> you know, I really only need the, I, I need the slides in by the time that you are presenting to me. Um, 
And if you're anything like me, sometimes I'm working on my stuff to the last minute. So I don't mind if you submit it, you know, 10 minutes before you meet with me uh, and you do your case presentation. I just need to be able to see it. And you're going to, and you're going to show it to me anyway on, um, on Zoom. But then I want to be able to go back and look at it on Moodle if I have any questions. So just make sure that it's uploaded by the time you present. Uh, does that, I think that probably seems fair. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, do it in a PowerPoint if you don't mind. Um, I presume you can do Keynote if you have Apple. Oh, uh, you know, that's, I, I don't know if, uh, if Keynote's a problem loading to um, Moodle or not. Um, Aiden can probably tell you. Uh, yep, the deadline for this uh, is, for this particular case, uh, well, I think we've already gone over that. It's pretty much by the time you present it to me. Um, do you put the slides together or do we share from our screen? You're gonna share from your screen. I, uh, can I use their de-identified initial evaluation data? Yes. Um, is screen sharing from our side pretty easy? Well, I, I'm terrible at learning new things and I figured it out. So I think we're okay. Um, uh, Joy can help you. And then there was a answer Rebecca's question. Did I already answer Rebecca, answer Joy's question? Joy, do you put the slides together or do we share? Okay. All right. Have I answered everybody's questions on this? Okay. Uh, let me rephrase that. Have I not answered anybody's questions on this? Uh, doctor, I just want to, with your permission, uh, jump in. If anybody had any uh, question, difficulty regarding how to share their uh, uh, slides, just shoot me an email. I'm going to um, set up a time, orient you if you don't know how to do it. Great. Thank you, Aiden. All right. Do you guys want to see the scoring rubric? A preferred source? For, no, I don't have a preferred source. Yes. Uh, how soon do we graduate after this? Uh, Sunday night at 11. Actually, no, I have no idea. Uh, I know you weren't really asking me. Uh, so let's see. So I actually have real cases and I don't think I'm comfortable to upload those even if I de-identified. De um, yeah, use your own judgment on that. If it doesn't seem like that is going to be ethically appropriate, um, change enough of it so that they're unidentifiable and it may not be the same case, that's okay. Again, remember, this is the goal here is to have practice and I want you to be able to hit every point on this case presentation just so you've had an opportunity to write this up think it through, and then uh, an opportunity to present in this manner. Okay, and I think there was, there was one, show me, the, show me the rubric. Anybody wanna see the rubric? I know somebody fired up the grill, but it was hailing, so you might as well as kill some time. Let's see here. Let's see here. Okay, almost there. And go to share, whoops, share. Okay, uh, can you all see this? Yep. 
Oh. <laughs> um, after Basically. you don't see the complete. You don't see it? No, it's, it's just one narrow band. Yeah, it looks okay. like just the uh, the tabs. Okay. Um, quick but important question. Do most people pass or if you don't, do you take it again? Um, if you don't pass in the rare event that you did not pass, you will take it again. Emphasis on rare. Emphasis on rare. All right, let me try one more time here to resume share. Uh, you getting a thin line again, or you got it? We have more now, but I see it. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. Okay. So um, it's uh, you can take a look here. There's your possible score on the left hand side. Um, this has also been uploaded to uh, Moodle, so you can see this there as well. And here are the areas that you need to address that's reflected in the PowerPoint that we just went through. Um, and you can see kind of what the expectation is. You can look at that at your leisure if you download that. And then here's the criteria, the passing criteria. So any score between six and 10 um, uh, is, a, is a pass. Um, there is no ex expectation that you're going to be getting nines and tens. Um, uh, you might get some, but uh, it's, it's less likely. You're probably going to be closer to the seven, six, seven, eight range um, would be my guess. Uh, maybe some of you have done this before, uh, so it might be easier for you. But that's the criteria. It's meant to be uh, transparent and easy to understand. Um, so again, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'm not hearing a lot of questions. Um, okay. So this is what it looks like. Um, uh, let's go with any final questions on anything. Can we use the slides from this review as a template? Um, yeah, that's fine. Would it be wise to have our PowerPoint mirror each of the criteria in the grading rubric? Yes, it would be wise. Okay. Other, other questions? Eddie is done. Okay. All right, guys. Um, well, uh, thanks for hanging in there uh, for the last two days, guys. We went over a tremendous amount of, <laughs> of information. That's the uh, classic sipping from a fire hose. Uh, it's, uh, it's fun to see you at this point of your uh, development. Uh, you're asking good questions. Feels like you guys as a group are on target. Uh, you're thinking about the right things. Um, you're asking the right questions. Um, and, and it's great. Yeah, it's just, it, feels, it feels like it's at the right place. So I really like that. Um, so my plan is the next time I talk to you will be in two weeks and we are going to be uh, doing our case presentations. Uh, one last push, if you have not signed up for case presentations, uh, you will be mailed a dead squirrel. So please do that as soon as you possibly can. And um, I am going to, uh, I have email through um, Alliance. So feel free to send me a message if you have any questions or anything that you need. And we'll go from there. Aiden, if you want to stay on the uh, Zoom for just a minute for you and I to close up, we'll do that. Sure. All right, everybody. Have a fabulous Sunday, whatever it is, or Monday in some cases. <laughs>